Hi guys and welcome to this video. Uh, here we're going to introduce a tool called the Laplace Transform. Um, so a Laplace Transform is uh, just a, a tool that provides us with a method to solve differential equations. Uh, we already know how to solve a lot of the differential equations we're going to address with this, but we're going to look at how this tool can, can do that for us as well. Um, this is used a lot in engineering applications. It is particularly useful when the coefficients of the y term in our differential equation, uh, if when that coefficient is constant, so it's useful if you have like a 3y term in your differential equation, but it's not going to be super useful if uh, you have a non-constant coefficient of y, like uh, t times y, for example. And the reason we use this is because it allows us to avoid direct integration, so we basically just have to do algebra. But in order to use Laplace transforms, we first need sort of a repository or a database of possible Laplace transforms. So if you think about differential equations and the types of functions that we face in them, uh, things like constants, exponential functions are probably ones that we want to define Laplace transforms for. So without further ado, let's define the Laplace transform. So the Laplace transform of a function, it's written L of f of t. So this is function notation. The Laplace is an operator. It's operating on a function. It takes as an input. It's func uh, takes as a, uh, its input a function, and the output of that function is another function. Okay, so it's sort of like when you input a number into an equation, you get another number out. It's the same principle, except this function takes a function as an input and creates a, another function as an output. So to visualize this, we can think of this in sort of a compartmental model where basically let's imagine that this represents our set of functions that we're going to feed into the Laplace transform and this is the corresponding output. So we're, we're going to start off in what we call the T domain. So we're going to be in the T domain first and then we're going to transform that function into something we call the S domain. The easiest way to think about this is when you did integration by substitution, uh, you would basically replace certain pieces with something like u. Uh, same thing we're doing here, where we're going to replace everything and cause it to go into the, t, the s domain. So we're going to have some function in here, f of t, and we're going to transform it using the Laplace function of f of t. And what we're going to get on the output side is a new function, which we're going to call capital F of little s. So we're actually going to be doing integration. So if you remember using lowercase and uppercase was sometimes used whenever uh, you are transferring between derivatives and integrals. But what we're going to get is a new function. That's why we call it capital F. It's not going to look the same. It's, and it's going to depend on a variable called s. Now s is actually a constant. And we'll talk about that here shortly. So the Laplace transform formally is defined in the following way. The Laplace of the function f of t is the improper integral from 0 to infinity of that function multiplied by this term, this factor called the exponentially decaying factor, e to the negative s times t. So s, there it is, the first instance of it. S is a constant that makes the integral converge. So when we're integrating up to infinity, think about integrals as areas under curves. And if you were just to integrate any old function, I mean, it could be constant, it could be actually decaying and growing. But if you add up all of this area under here and you go out all the way to infinity, then a lot of times you're going to get infinite integrals. You're going to get um, end up with integrals that diverge to one of the infinities. What this multiplication factor does is regardless of what f of t is doing, so let's say f of t, let's say f of t does this, well when you multiply a linear function by an exponentially decaying one, what you're going to get is you're going to get something that decays down to zero, and so when that happens, you're going to get finite area. So think about this as f of t, it could be an increasing function whose integral is going to diverge to infinity, whose area under the curve is infinite. Think about this guy as f of t times an exponentially decaying function. Well, if the, even if this is growing, when you multiply it by something that's getting infinitesimally smaller, that's going to cause the function to decay down to zero. And so 
when Laplace, the inventor of this, uh, decided on what this function would look like, he knew that it would converge if you multiplied it by something that's exponentially decaying. And the boundary zero to infinity you're going to see are very nice. The reason he chose these is because when you evaluate things at zero, it's fairly easy to do. And when you evaluate things at infinity, provided that they decay, then we're going to get a lot of zeros because of this. So this required a lot of work on the part of the creator, but ultimately he designed it this way so that uh, things would work out nicely. So let's see how we could compute, build this database of Laplace transforms. So first of all, let's find the Laplace transform of f of t equals 3. Then we're going to generalize the result to any constant. Um, you know, 3 was just sort of an arbitrary choice, but any constant uh, f of t equals c. So by definition, the Laplace of our function 3 is going to equal the integral from 0 to infinity of the function times e to the negative st dt. Now this is an integral that we'd easily dump into Wolfram Alpha. It will compute it for us. But let's just go ahead and do this one by hand to see how this works out. So the first thing we need to do is, well, let me factor out that 3 to make this integral uh, a little bit easier to compute. So to integrate e to the negative st, now s is just a constant, right? So if I integrated e to the negative 3t, uh, if I integrated that, for example, then what I would need to do is uh, make a u substitution up here. I'd say let u equal negative 3t. And then I would have uh, du equals negative 3dt. And because I want to replace dt with something in terms of du, if I divide both sides by 3, negative 3, I'll get that this integral becomes e to the u. Um, not times, not dt anymore. I'm going to replace dt with negative one-third du. And you can see that we can do that substitution and we end up getting negative one-third integral of e to the u du. And that's going to come out to be negative one-third e to the u. And u was negative 3t, so we have e to the negative 3t. So we see that basically this uh, is going to be one over whatever this exponent is. So this is going to be 3 times the integral of e to the negative st is negative 1 over s e to the negative st. Again, this is something you can compute in Wolfram Alpha and feel free to do that. And now we need to evaluate this integral from t equals 0 to t equals infinity. Okay, now I'm not going to do the limit definition. I'm just going to actually go ahead and plug in infinity because it's a little bit easier to work with and we don't have as much notation. So I'm going to evaluate this as negative 3 over s e to the negative s times infinity minus negative 3 over s e to the negative s times 0. Now here's where we can appreciate the, the, the boundaries of integration. Um, as long as, now this is going to be e to a really large negative number as long as s is greater than zero, as long as we define the constant s to be positive, then this is going to, this whole thing right here is going to approach zero because again, we take e to a really, really infinitely large negative power, this thing is gonna decay down to zero. Um, so I'll just make a point here if s is bigger than zero. Now s is a constant, so we just need to make this statement one time to say that this will only converge to zero as long as s is bigger than zero. The reason we need to often lay out these conditions is because if later on we make a different argument about s, one that would be contradictory to saying s is greater than zero, like later we made another claim that as long as s is less than zero, then obviously we would have a contradiction. So this is really not that critical for most of these because they will often work out. Um, let's see what happens here. So this becomes zero. This other guy over here, well, e to the zero, that's going to be one. So I'll have minus negative three over s times one. And then I'll have negative negative three over s, which is just three over s. So all that said, the Laplace of three is equal to the function three over s. So we've just transformed the function f of t equals three to the function capital F of S equals three over S. 
And you can probably see that we want to make a generalization. We don't want to have to rebuild this same Laplace for say Laplace of two or Laplace of negative five. So if we had just replaced three with little c, then you'd see that everything would remain the same. We would have, except the threes would be replaced with c's, and the three here would be replaced with c, and the three here would be replaced with c, and the three here would be replaced with c, and the three here would be replaced with c. So we're going to make this general conclusion. We're going to say, well, you know what? If, if I had done this for any other constant, then my answer would have been that the Laplace of a constant is equal to the constant over s. So that's a formula that we can add to our database and we can use freely next time we want to compute a transform. So as another example, we could say that the Laplace of 10 is going to be 10 over s. The Laplace of negative pi is going to be negative pi over s. The Laplace of 2 thirds is going to be 2 thirds over s. Or you could write that as um, s over 1, and you could write this as 2 over 3s if you, if you chose to do it that way. So now we have a robust formula that applies to any constant. Let's do this for one more. We'll say now that we want to compute the Laplace transform of an exponential, e to the 2t. And this process is going to be just the same. It's defined as the same integral, except we're going to say the Laplace of e to the 2t is going to equal uh, the integral from 0 to infinity of the function times e to the negative st dt. Now, because these are the same base, I, I can add their exponents together. And this is going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the 2 minus s times t. So I'll have e to the 2t minus st, and I can write that as e to the 2 minus s times t. Now remember, this right here, this is a constant. That's a constant right there. Because it's a constant minus another constant. And so um, one other way I could write that is I can say that this is going to be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative quantity s minus 2 times t. And the reason I write it like that is because now again I can see that this is going to be an exponentially decaying function. And when I go to integrate this, again I can use Wolfram Alpha or whatever I want, I will get 1 over negative quantity s minus 2 e to the negative s minus 2 t and that's going to be evaluated from t equals 0 to t equals infinity. Now I'm going to plug in my boundaries so I'll have negative I'll have 1 over 1 over negative s minus 2 e to the negative quantity s minus 2 times infinity minus 1 over negative quantity s minus 2 e to the negative quantity s minus 2 times 0. So once again, as long as this, this piece right here, as long as that is positive, then this whole exponent will be negative. So I'll just say as long as s minus 2 is bigger than 0, so as long as s is bigger than 2, Again, not, that's not really going to matter, but it's just there to say that, in, again, later on, if we had a conflict, we could resolve this. And so now this will, again, decay to zero. And this second term, e to the something times zero, will be one. So this whole term will become zero. And I'll have minus one over quantity negative s minus two. And the two negatives can cancel, so I'll just have 1 over s minus 2. And that's my answer. Uh, what I can conclude now is from back up here that the Laplace of e to the 2t is going to be this function. Now you can probably make the conclusion here that the Laplace of e to any constant times t is just going to be 1 over s minus that constant. We'll go ahead and stop here for this video. Um, in the next video, we'll propose how we're going to use this to solve equations.